Julian Schulthaus. And I'm AJ Muncie. This news watch isn't your typical one. This is our last show, uh, and we'll show some of the stories that we've worked the hardest on this semester. Many of these stories we poured lots of hours into, and these stories meant a lot to us. Please enjoy what our education has led us to. If you remember back a couple of weeks to the Oscars, you'll probably think of one big moment, even if you didn't watch the Oscars. Now, there are many different opinions on who's in the wrong, whether it's on Will Smith or on Chris Rock. But even before the broadcast was over, social media was bombarded with memes and personal opinions. Some people who didn't watch the Oscars would have known about it within seconds. Social media has gotten to a point where everyone can voice their opinion on anything and can create a divide among people. I looked into the controversy and actually looked into what set off the Oscars issue and who may have benefited from it. Before we take a look at social media, it is important to understand the joke Chris Rock made was about Jada Smith's alopecia. But what is alopecia? So alopecia is a broad category of hair loss conditions. So alopecia itself means that you're losing your hair, and there's numerous different forms of types that you can lose your hair. Cartman is unsure what kind of alopecia Jada Smith has. Um, she's been fighting it for a number of years though, so I imagine it's something more chronic in nature. And just based on some of the social media things that I've seen, I imagine it's something that's probably out of her control as well. Alopecia and a lot of other similar conditions have been getting a lot of attention recently due to the Oscars incident. But social media is the true star. But social media has significantly shaped our society this past decade. Hey, check this out. Social media has quite the history and has done many things for us. It can unite people and divide people. I don't think that the concept has, is new. Um, certainly our tools are new. And, um, and of course, it reaches a much wider scale. With the internet came a lot of these different platforms to reach people, communicate, and engage. But with all the good things, there's also quite a bit of bad. And people might argue that social media has ruined things. You know, there's misinformation and there's information, so much bullying. And, um, but, and those are the lows, but we also have the highs. And they, they both have to work together. Social media also allows for connectivity. This is that social media allows for a community of people um, that may not have access to a community of people. Having easier access to information, whether it is true or not, has shaped our society. It has also brought forward many stories that people might not have heard of before social media. We would also hear things about perspectives we wouldn't have before, or at least not in a timely manner. And, um, and that would be the negative side, is that everyone felt entitled to an opinion. But on the positive side, uh, you had a lot more examination. What do the Black intersectional feminists say? Specifically on the Oscars controversy, everyone had something to say. But a lot had bias on either side, dividing people. But everyone has different experiences and a different idea from it. Social media is bittersweet, as there is bias and opinion. So there is much more behind the scenes that people don't see. Everyone's experience on social media is catered to the individual. You don't get fed the same stories, perspective, or information that the person next to you gets. It, you, something, can't both, something can't be just good or just bad in, in this circumstance. It's too big. Social media is a powerful tool. It can be good or bad. Remember to take everything with a grain of salt because there's a lot we do know, but equally as much we don't. Julian Schulthaus, Newswatch Extra. The pandemic and the restrictions that came with it have dealt a serious blow to non-essential businesses across the city. That's right, and churches across the city have been no exception to this. Our Noah Rashog takes on a look through one local church here in Edmonton and the ways it has been adapting to survive the pandemic. Heritage International Church is a local Edmonton church that was opened by Pastor Sixtus Ayek four years ago. Being a smaller organization, the pandemic affected it in many ways, but rather than throwing up their hands in defeat, this church took this opportunity to become a seed and spread its reach to others. 
we had a lot of membership. We had a lot of people here. When it started and the government have to put um, like the social distancing, limiting the number of people, it was still fine for the first few months. People were at home following, following the services on Zoom. Some will come here once in a while because we had a limited amount of uh, members to attend. We must learn also how to diversify. You can't just be there and just hope on stuff or just believe. We will believe and where is the end? Your members might be struck. Things might happen. Where do you rest on? That's why so many churches were closed. With the in-person gatherings at the church being limited to varying degrees over the past two years, the church has had to think outside of the box to keep their attendance up while weathering the pandemic storm. One way they've done so is through online sermons. After hiring a media manager, the church has taken to the internet to broadcast its message, with viewership here at home to across the Atlantic, in Rwanda, and in Uganda. So as much as the pandemic wasn't something that nobody wanted, having to do most of the things online was somewhat a blessing for persons who are not able to physically be at the church. You find that when you use like the online programs, whether it be YouTube, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Instagram, you actually touch the lives of persons who doesn't even attend our church. The church hopes to continue to spread compassion, love, and joy to the community as the doors begin to open back up again. The church will continue to run its online sermons after the success in bringing in viewers from all over the world. Their goal is to engage people and to be a part of something special, a goal the church feels it has achieved. As the province begins to change the way it deals with the pandemic, it's beginning to seem this church is coming out of the pain and into the promised land. Through faith, community, and a whole lot of ingenuity, this church so full of soul has stood against everything the world has thrown over it these past few years. I'm Noah Shock for Nate Newswatch. When it comes to starting up a local business, there's always comes a point where the founder decides to pass on ownership to another person that they may not be related to. But one bowling alley in Edmonton has done the opposite. Our Adil Ahmed visited Plaza Bowling to find out why the business has chosen to keep ownership within the family. Hey guys, now there's about seven bowling alleys here in the city of Edmonton alone, but there's not a whole lot of them that have stayed independent, like Plaza Bowling right behind me. They've been a bowling alley that's been around for the last 60 plus years now, and the most unique thing about them is that they stayed family owned throughout the entire time. Since 1959, Plaza Bowling has been right up the alley for people to have a good time. It's a third generation owned business with ownership duties being passed down from one generation to another. It's something that the business feels grateful for. I think it's a pretty rare story to have a business stay family run for so long. And I think that, you know, people in, in Edmonton have sort of rallied around it a little bit and, and love coming out and supporting. And, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty neat. The bowling alley was first founded by Trevor's grandfather, Lawrence Stride, just over 60 years ago, who was initially working in a different industry before making the switch over to bowling. So my grandpa Lori was living, uh, they were living on the coast and he was working in the forestry industry and he had, uh, had an injury and it forced him to come out to Alberta and look for different alternatives and he got involved in the bowling industry and uh, saw a huge opportunity and, and essentially got all the aunts and uncles involved and his parents and everyone he could to get the funds together to, to open Plaza. Lawrence took care of the business for 18 years before handing the keys over to his son, Terry, who ran the business for 40 years before passing it over to his son and current owner, Trevor, back in 2017. Something that he never thought would happen. I was working in, in the restaurant business and, and working for a uh, the Famosa Pizzeria group and, and working for their head office. And, and so we were out in Vancouver and, and my dad started talking about selling the business probably around 2015. And we just started engaging in discussions and talking about what it would look like. And we got pretty excited at the opportunity to, to take it over. Now, this bowling alley may have been around for the last 50 plus years, hence the vintage view behind me. But 
These bowling balls right here have been around longer than I have been alive. Those are, those are from the 70s. They, they've got a few bumps and bruises on them, but they're, uh, they're still trucking. While they may have some bumps and bruises on the bowling balls, one thing is certain. The Strides' relationship with their employees and customers haven't gone in the gutter. I love it. It's the best job ever. Great people, great environment. Uh, like the people we work with are great. I get to work with my friends and like good vibes all around. Plaza Bowling currently has only one location in the city. However, the bowling alley is looking to get a strike on a new location in South Edmonton for the near future. <laughs> for Nate Newswatch Extra, I'm Adil Ahmed. After the break, we take a look at a different spin on the church that survived the pandemic and the family owned bowling alley. Plus, we take a look at a candy shop here in Edmonton that has flavors you've never heard of. Stay tuned. A new local candy shop in Northwest Edmonton has been getting a lot of buzz around the city with treats they can't purchase at any other convenience stores in Edmonton. The Yeg Exotic Candy Shop has gotten a lot of love and support from Edmontonians. Our Brandon Beauchamp gives us a taste on what makes this particular candy shop so sweet. Thanks guys, I'm currently outside Yeg Exotic Candy Store and uh, let me tell you, they are not your average candy store. I'm going to show you why Yeg Exotic is more different than other candy shops. Yeg Exotic Candy Shop located north of West Edmonton Mall is no ordinary candy shop. They are famous for their variety of sodas and snacks, some in which Edmontonians have never seen before. Jesse Matthews tells us why his candy shop is more unique than other shops. You know, well, we don't just sell regular Kit Kats. We sell like 10 different kind of Kit Kats. Chips, we sell like chips that you can't seem to get here. We got like Thai snacks, uh, Thai uh, chips. We got, you know, Lay's chips, 7-Eleven chips from like Thailand, uh, Vietnam, um, Stax chips, like just products that you just can't seem to get here. Uh, candy stores seem to carry like bulk candy. We don't try to do the bulk candy, we just do the exotic candy. Yeg Exotic opened their doors for the first time in early January of 2022. Yeg Exotic has many vending machines all across the city, from north side all the way to south side Edmonton. Yeg Exotic also has their own delivery service where they deliver door to door. Jesse Matthews says that the online delivery saved his business over the course of the pandemic. Yeg Exotic Candy Shop has rapidly been growing more and more by the day. This is all because of their website which you can place orders online and get delivery. And a lot of their publicity has been because of their TikTok account. Uh, I think TikTok's helped quite a bit actually. So, like. Probably like 70% of the people were saying they heard about us on TikTok. So yeah, it's, I think it's helped out a lot. With the trucker convoy going on all over Canada, it has not stopped Yeg Exotic from meeting their supplies and demands over the course of the pandemic. Jesse says he does his best to keep certain products in stock, but sometimes he may not be able to buy certain products as they sell out very fast. Jesse also says that ever since he opened up the store, that he enjoys the customers more in person compared to online when Yeg Exotic first began. And customers always find something new. Yeah, uh, we, well we got a lot because we, we like to drink pop, we play video games, stuff like that. So I got mostly like said the code red because the best drink. And then how do you not buy anything when you see all the colors and drinks like bunch of lemonade, some like Mountain Dews that I've never seen before. Just really neat stuff, you know what I mean? It's hard not to buy anything from here. With this being Exog Yeg's first location in Northwest Edmonton, Jesse Matthews plans to have these exotic vending machines around the city within the next few months. I'm Brennan Beauchon, Nate Newswatch. Extra. Although most people are advised to separate work from family and personal from professional, this particular business chose to do the opposite of that and make their business a part of the family. Our SJ Nazal visits a family-owned business, Plaza Bowling, to find out what makes this business a successful one. Plaza Bowling is not only a successful business run by the Stride family, it is part of the Stride family. 
When Lauren Stride first opened Plaza Bowling back in 1959, he did not expect business to become as successful as it is now. And in 1977, after 18 years of running the business, Lawrence realized it was time for him to retire and sell the business to new owners. However, this is when Terry Stride, Lawrence's son, quit his job to take over and run Plaza Bowling. Terry held the owner and management position for the plaza for 40 years until it was time for him to pass it down to its current owner, his son, Trevor Stride. The idea of seeing the business leave the family was not ideal. This year marks the 63rd anniversary of the opening of Plaza Bowling. And although the owners have changed throughout the years, the place has stayed pretty much the same. These bowling balls and pins have been looked after and maintained by all three owners over the past six decades. Those are from the 70s. They, they've got a few bumps and bruises on them, but they're, uh, they're still trucking. The bowling alley has a unique schedule. It's open to the public Wednesdays through Sundays and is reserved for leagues on Mondays and Tuesdays. The pressure got to him. Mondays and Tuesdays are some of the more steady days for the employees as the shift is predictable and pre-planned with activities to keep the excitement <laughs> and trophies for the winners. Three strikes in a row, three spares in a row, and over 200. Plaza Bowling likes to keep score of the achievement that its visitors have, with the most strikes in one game being posted on the wall to give newcomers a motivation to match that high score. <laughs> And to help with that, visitors are provided with the necessary bowling shoes to help them enjoy their games while staying safe and protecting the vintage lanes at the same time. Although some of the employees don't necessarily have Stride as their last name, they feel as though they are part of the family. I love it. It's the best job ever. Great people, great environment. Current owner Trevor Stride enjoys taking his staff members on team building trips to help further the team's bond with one another. And yes, we're here to work, but we have lots of fun. Before the pandemic, Trevor would take the staff to play curling and lawn bowling, amongst other things, to help them spend more quality time together and learn more about one another. Oh, it's still recording. Yeah! We love Plaza Bowl! Plaza Bowling has opened its doors for those who are looking forward to starting a new family by allowing them to take their wedding photos at the alley. With the owners being family-oriented individuals, it is evident that they put family values first even when it comes to running their business. Trevor Stride says he is looking forward to the day where he can pass this business down to his children to uphold the tradition. He's like the most chill boss ever. Nate Newswatch Extra, SJ Nazal. A lot has been happening with the pandemic and several changes have been made. Now we go to Emanuela Osamudiaman, who takes us to a local church who shares their struggle to triumph story with the turmoil they faced in these times. Thanks guys. So the pandemic has changed the world for everyone with mandates, masking and maximums. And the church has been no exception to that. And we see how one local church in Edmonton, Heritage International Church, sees their way through these troubling times. Heritage International Church is a local Edmonton church that was opened by Pastor Sixtus Ayuk four years ago. Being a smaller organization, the pandemic has affected it in many ways. But rather than throwing its hands up in defeat, this church took the opportunity to become a seed and spread its reach to others. We had a lot of membership. We had a lot of people here. When it started and the government had to put um, like the social distancing, limiting the number of people. It was still fine for the first few months. People were at home following, following the services on Zoom. Some will come here once in a while because we had a limited amount of uh, members to attend. We must learn also how to diversify. You can't just be there and just hope on stuff or just believe. We will believe and where is the end? Your members might be strong. Things might happen. Where do you rest on? That's why so many churches were closed. With the in-person gatherings at the church being limited to varying degrees over the past two years, the churches had to think outside the box to keep attendance up while weathering the pandemic storm. One way they've done so is through online sermons. 
After hiring a media manager, the church has taken the internet to broadcast its message with viewership from here at home to across the Atlantic in Rwanda and Uganda. So as much as the pandemic wasn't something that nobody wanted, having to do most of the things online was somewhat a blessing for persons who are not able to physically be at the church. You find that when you use like the online programs, whether it be YouTube, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Instagram, you actually touch the lives of persons who doesn't even attend our church. The church hopes to continue to spread compassion, love and joy to the community as the doors open up back again. The church will continue to run its online sermons after their success in bringing viewers from all around the world. Their goal is to engage people to be a part of something special, a goal the church feels it has achieved. Coming up after the break, we dine in at a few of the city's best diners and kick up our feet with some shelf-worthy kicks. Plus, we turn up the tunes to celebrate 40 years of Edmonton's Cook County Saloon. Stay tuned. Diners are a girl's best friend, at, at least they say. Is that so, Jade? Well, for me anyways. And Edmonton's got plenty of them. The red vinyl, the checkerboard floors, and the jukebox tunes are a staple to diner culture, not to mention the comfort food. Great shakes, pies, and burgers are a diner a dozen, and I had the opportunity to take a look back into the 50s at popular hotspots and showcase some of Edmonton's best diners of today. I found that each place is unique to their own style in the decor, the history, and the food, and it was a lot of fun getting to know each diner and learn what makes them special to Edmonton. Let's take a look. Back in the day, whether you were a working hat or a youngster looking for a milkshake hit, downtown Edmonton was the diner haven of the city. Places like the Shasta Cafe, the Carousel, and the Coffee Cup Inn served up some of the best diner experiences, while other spots had their unique quirks. The Silk Hat opened in 1913 and operated for 94 years before closing in 2007. It was famous for its tea readers and later became a nostalgic reminder for older generations and a blast into the past for the young. The American Dairy Lunch sat under the Strand Theatre, fixed with gargoyle monuments and glass bricks that allowed patrons to look up and watch pedestrians pass over. Before cell phones, meet me under the clock at Johnson's was the plan. 1920s Johnson's Cafe was a landmark for meetups under the iconic clock mounted on the corner of the Selkirk Hotel. The past is in the past, and while we may not have Johnson's or the Shasta Cafe or the original Silk Hat anymore, what once was all lost isn't all gone. The Commodore here continues to serve up hot favorites over its counters after all these years. Probably the only authentic diner around. Opening in 1942, the Commodore has been handed down for three generations of the G family, marking it as Edmonton's longest family-run restaurant. I'm kind of proud that we can kind of keep it going for as long as, uh, as we have, because uh, restaurants, uh, especially these times, it's uh, difficult. They come and go. Places like the Edmonton Museum, the Food Network Channel, and even a cartoonist have acknowledged the Commodore. It's decorated with history and past entertainers and hopes to get back into live music in the coming weeks. Diners have emerged throughout Edmonton over the years, while places like Daddy O remain their original self. We have things like pecan pie and key lime pie and bread pudding, but the rest of the food is just a straight up Cajun. Daddy O is known for its sweet potato fries and New Orleans spin on the classic diner. It's dressed in original jukeboxes and upholstery booths from the 50s with touches of modern additions. What started as a hotspot for teens and greasers, lovebirds and midnight drivers has remained a North American staple. The red vinyl, the jukebox jams and the checkered floor, not to mention the food. Diners are the perfect place for keeping the best of times alive. Like they're a throwback but at the same time you can still be relevant today. From the music to the decor to the food, Rockin' Robins leaves an impression that brings customers back for more. Red and white tables and the floor and, and uh, Elvis and Marilyn pictures on the walls. It's, it's good. <laughs> they serve the best in pie, eggs and burgers that keep the diner scene thriving. This is homemade stuff. This is made here. It doesn't come out of a box. And that's part of the magic about this place. Well, we may not have the sock hop anymore, or don the latest trend of the poodle skirt, or even hear Chubby Checker on the radio these days. But one thing's for certain, diners are here to stay. 
The Coca-Cola is always cold, the french fries are always hot, and there's always, always room for a milkshake. For Nate News Watch Extra, I'm AJ Muncie. There's a new retail market in Edmonton that is kicking up a storm. Reselling sneakers is on the rise, and one local entrepreneur is bringing a new wave of collectors to West Edmonton Mall. Nate Newswatch reporter Quentin Schroeder has the story. Last time I was reporting on White Ave, it was minus 30. I had my winter jacket, my winter boots on. Today is much nicer, though. The snow is melted. I've got my sneakers on. Can we get a quick little zoom in? These ones are just okay, though. If you're looking for something a bit nicer, there's a handful of stores in Edmonton that specialize in rare and collectible sneakers. There's from another vintage right behind me, and I got a chance to visit a brand new store in West Edmonton Mall a few months ago. Nate Reinhardt is locking up after a busy day of serving customers. What makes his new store so unique is that it's the first of its kind in West Edmonton Mall. We're definitely the first store in the mall that does this, so it's, it's, it was a little bit unique trying to you know, figure out our lease agreement. Among the 800 other stores in North America's biggest mall, Authentics Boutique Corporation, or AB Co., is the first to resell sneakers. Yeah, so uh, three years ago, or I guess three and a half years ago now, um, kind of started uh, just a little resale. Store was in St. Albert, it was at this uh, place called The Collective. Just as we continue to grow through shoe sizes, Nate's business continued to see growth since day one. Yeah, this is my fourth location now, so it's like, I was in a little pop-up store like tucked away downtown St. Albert, and then like, then your revenue goes up to like your next spot and then you go up to the next spot and now like we're in the, like we're in the mall. Brands like Nike and Adidas release some of their shoes in limited quantities. Sneaker enthusiasts purchase the shoes from retailers and manufacturers. The shoes can then be thrifted or resold, allowing for a profit to be made. With like the older stuff, like you, it's never going to come out again. It's, it's 15, 20 years old, so like the price is just going to continually go up. And when they first released, people were buying them to wear them. So like to find them in good condition 15 years later when the shoes weren't, what they are now is even harder to do, and I think that just drives the price even more. These limited edition sneakers can cost anywhere from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. And there's, it's growing more as a, like a, like more of a, for a resale market, right? Because it's kind of like stocks, right? Where you buy sneakers, you hold on to them, or you sell them, right? The North American resale sneaker market has generated over $3 billion since 2019. And that number is expected to jump to $30 billion by 2030. It's a very lucrative business. And Nate Reinhardt isn't the only one in town reselling limited edition sneakers. From another vintage on White Ave, thinks that social media played a big part in the recent sneaker resale boom. It really puts a focus on so many different things, and sneakers and streetwear became one of those things. Celebrities and athletes continue to be a factor on why some current and old sneakers become popular. I think people always want what's kind of popular, and celebrities have always been the facilitators for that. You look at a celebrity and they are basically on a pinnacle where they're viewed by all different angles, Vintage and fashion trends may come and go, but the sneaker resale market doesn't appear to be at a standstill. I think it's going to keep going um, as long as I think there's a huge interest in different shoes. I think sneakers and reselling will always be a thing. It always has been a thing. Collectors have kept their pairs brand new. People are always going to need shoes, so it just kind of depends on, uh, on what's hot, really. As long as brands continue to release limited quantities and not saturate the market, reselling shoes will continue to be a big business. Quentin Schroeder, Nate News Watch Extra. With restrictions easing for venues and clubs across the province, many people are eager to get back into the fun. For decades now, this bar just off White Ave has been where country and nightlife intersect. Ari and Tidswell went down to Cook County Saloon to see how things are shaping up for its 40th birthday and find out about its story. Thank you, Jaden Julian. My name is Ian Tidswell, and we're here at the historic Cook County Saloon. They just celebrated their 40th anniversary last Friday night. Let's take a look inside and meet some of the people that make it all happen. For 40 years, Cook County has been Edmonton's premier country nightclub. Curtis Grambo has graced the stage many times over his career. A Cook County Saloon back in 1989, I believe it was one of the first A room, you know, there's B room, C rooms. It was one of the first ones that we ever played. So it's very exciting. And I think the first week we came in, it was uh, rodeo week. And for kids, we were only, you know, 19, uh, 
20 years old in that age, it was pretty amazing. With many of the city's music venues closing, there are not a lot of places to get a start. This has always been, as far as country music goes, this has been the only place really to play all the time. Even if you already have a foothold, there has to be a hub for a music scene. Uh, Barry here at Cook County always bringing in bigger names, so it gives smaller names a chance to meet and actually open up for them and, and play with them. Barry Sparrow was a pioneer in the city, adapting to changing nightlife culture. Let's hear how it all began. Well, it was uh, back in 81, we actually opened the doors, but the, the idea came up uh, about a year prior to that, and uh, it was uh, a reasoning for it was is that there was a new nightclub license that was coming out. It was pretty archaic back in the day, and, and uh, this new license came out, and I'm thinking, wow, this is a massive opportunity to get on the ground floor, being one of the first ones out there. The opportunities kept coming, with the venue hosting many legendary artists over the decades. Do you have a favorite memory of bringing in an act, Barry? I literally got George Strait to play for $3,000 a show. So that's kind of one of the, the great moments, right? So what do you see as the future of the club? We're locked in here and we're good to go for as long as we want, I think. And, and no reason why we shouldn't, shouldn't want to do what we're doing. We love it. You walk in here, you get a feeling, right? That's what I got when I first opened the place. When I first walked in there, I went, this is it. Speaking of the future, Barry's son Casey has been taking over the operations. Keeping it in the family is important to him. It's been a huge part of my life. It's, I call it my second home, pretty much, so <laughs> it'd always be that to me. <laughs> From scrubbing the floors, moving up to bartending, then growing into his current role, Casey is set to keep things rocking for years to come. It helps having my dad kind of mentor me through lots of it and uh, show me the ropes, as they would say, and um, couldn't think of anyone better to learn from. Here's to another 40 years of country music and good times. That wraps up our extra show, and it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us on, joining us on this journey. But we're not done yet. Tune in two weeks from now for the final show of the semester and we'll have another look at some of the great stories in City Hotspots. Have a great weekend and best of the day.